Guys, just remember what we said before, let's continue this lesson and let's finish it today. Remember what we said before, just quickly just revise it. Anybody who can remind me of what we said before? Please, yes, Jawad, try. Anything? I was talking about the uh, other information. Not other groups we're talking about. Let's <laughs> exactly, different other groups of Protestantism. So we said that Protestantism and out of Protestantism, the main group, we had some groups, if we can say. Like different groups of Protestantism, originally they were all Protestants, but then they just came you know, out, deviated and every group gave another name, depends on the background of this group. Yes, sorry? Like Calvinism, for example. Calvinism in which country? Switzerland. Switzerland, exactly. And then we talked about uh, John Knox, who went to uh, Switzerland, who paid a visit to Switzerland. He copied Calvinism and then he went back to Scotland to apply his own version of Calvinism and he gave it the name of Presbyterians. And then we said that the Hognets or the Protestants in France were given the name of Hognets and then there was a kind of conflict between the Catholics in France, who were the majority and the minority of the Protestants, the new group of Protestantism, which was called the Hognets, as I said. And the result was June 2000, death or kill of uh, the Protestants. Then we talked about the role of, uh, yeah, then we talked about another group, the Anabaptists, and we say that Anabaptist means to re baptize, or baptize again, and then I told you the story, and how actually they believe in all the. Uh, exactly, because when you are a child, when you are a child, you are not given the choice to decide whether you want to be Christian or not. So you have to be given this choice again when you are a girl. Then we talked about the role of women reformers. We talked about Renaissance before, and then we said that there were figures, I mean female figures in this age of of uh, Renaissance. It's the same here as well. Also, there are some figures here, female figures in the age of Reformation. We just you know, give some examples, like the sister of the King of France at the time who sheltered. Calvin, and also the wife of Martin Luther, who argued about the equality in uh, marriage between men and women. All right, let's just start with objective number three. Guys, from the beginning of uh, the lesson of Reformation, I mean section three, we were referring to uh, Protestants when we say Reformation, right? When we talk about Reformation, we meant by that Reformation that was done by the Protestants against the wrong practices of the Catholic Church, right? All right. Today we are going to see something else, a new thing, which is the Catholics who were just, you know, sitting aside all that time and they were just watching some of their followers converting to Protestantism. So by time, they recognize that Protestantism is spreading very fast. And if they keep silent doing nothing, then it will come a day when they are going to lose all their supporters. So they have to do something. The thing that was kind of copying what the Protestants were doing. If the Protestants were doing Reformation, then why can't we do a Reformation? If we do a Reformation, then we are not going to lose our support. Because our supporters are diverting or <coughs> conversing because they are and they have problems about, uh, they have like some resentments about the wrong practices in the Catholic Church. So if we decided to reform from within the Catholic Church, then we are not going to lose our supporters. This is why the title has changed here, and it's Catholic Reformation and not Protestant Reformation anymore. But we're going to see if this was a true Reformation process or a just fake Reformation process. It seems they reformed the Catholic Church from within the Catholic Church. From within the Catholic Church. We wanted to give kind of um, an impression that we recognize our mistakes and we're going to change. We don't want somebody to. Convert and then ask us to change. Listen to this, guys. Uh, here, actually, uh, it's a turn point in the history of Catholicism. Why turn point? Who can tell me why it's a turn point? Yes? Sorry? First sect. What do you mean? First sect. Uh, like, uh, like smaller like, sect. No, no, it's not a small sect, actually. It's Catholicism. The Catholic Church was a at the time of Europe. Guys! Can't you see that this is the first time the Catholic Church admit that there is a mistake? Yes. Right? It's a turn point because now they already admitted that there is a mistake. If there is no mistake, then why should they reform? What are you going to reform if you didn't have any problems? Right? This is kind of turn point in the history of Catholicism because it's the first time 
they recognize and admit that there are wrong practices in the Catholic Church. No doubt, there are wrong practices. Now let's see how they handle it. We have like three figures here in the Catholic uh, Formation age. Those were considered as the leaders of the Reformation uh, for the Catholics. Ignatius of Loyola, Ignatius from the city of Loyola in Spain, Pope Paul III, Pope Paul IV, and they have nothing to do with our faith Paul. Ignatius, what was his achievement? He composed a book, he, made, he actually named it the Spiritual Exercises. He composed his book after he was engaged in a fight against the Protestants, where he physically injured, and he was thinking of the scenes and the mistakes he did in his life. And he just recognized that in one moment he could have lost his life, so he could have lost the chance to compensate or to back up his mistakes. So what that's going to do? Let's devote the rest of, rest of the time for worship. He called for different types of worship in his book, prayer, study, meditation, other things. Now, uh, then, with the blessing of the Pope, he established the Society of Jesus. I mean, it's an organization, Society means Organization of Jesus. As kind of shortcut, they call it the Jesus. Now, who had three activities or three missions? The main missions, the three main missions of this Jesus were first of all, they have to start building schools. Why do you build the school, guys? To promote for the Catholic education. So it's a kind of how I can how can I gain more support by attracting more students to my Catholic schools so I will raise like a, a Catholic generation. This is number one. Number two, Jesus converted non Christians. What do we mean by many Christians? Like people who have no religion were in Europe. In Europe, most of the people were either Catholics or Protestants. So where to get people from? Africa. Africa. Well, Africa. Which is easier for you to convert somebody who have a religion or somebody who doesn't have a religion? Why? Because it's a new idea. Exactly, because if he has a religion. The first thing you have to do is to compare between his own religion and the thing that you are telling him about the new religion. It's going to be like something difficult, really. He, for sure he will find advantages here and disadvantages there and why. But if he has no religion like atheism, for example, or like the African people who were naturalists, they used to worship nature. Alright? So it will be easier for them to convert. So, as you can see here, it's a man, it's a second. another third point. Why? Because it is kind of a new uh, that fight, a new challenge between Protestants and Catholics. It's a kind of race on who's going to gain more supporters now from other countries, not only from Europe. Number three, stop the spread of Protestantism. So it's a mission to stop the spread of Protestantism. How can I stop uh, the spread of Protestantism if I am a Catholic? First of all, by facing the mistakes, this is why they already say that there is a kind of reformation process. Number two, by creating schools to promote uh, Catholic Catholic Christianity. Number three, by trying to gain more supporters, so I will outnumber the uh, Protestants. Let's see the second figure and the third figure. Pope Paul the third. The third. Pope Paul the third took actually four important steps. First of all, he directed the Council of Cardinals, Cardinals means church leaders or monks, to investigate indulgences. It's okay. Why most of the people who shifted from uh, the Catholic Church were upset? From the wrong practices. What was the main wrong practice? Selling of the indulgences. Exactly. Now, did he say that selling of the indulgences is wrong? Did he admit it? No. He no. Said. But he said that, all oh, right, this is what, what is your, this is your concern, it's okay, I'm going to investigate. It's a kind of, all right, I'm not promising to find like a radical solution for it, but I'm going to investigate the nature of, uh, of the indulgences. All right? And other things. Number two, he approved the Jesuit order, the organization that was established by Ignatius. What does it mean, approved? If you have enough money now and you want to make a copy, 
You can hire employees, you can buy the restaurants and the tools, and you can start working. Is it going to work like that? What is missing? License. You need a license, you need a permission from the government, right? Without the blessing of the book, you're not going to have an effective organization because it's not admitted by the highest position of the Catholic Church. So he already blessed it, I mean, approved it. Number three, he used the Inquisition, which is a proper judicial process established to try and punish those thought to be heretics. It's a kind of exceptional privilege that is given only to the Pope because he is the Pope. Alright, to punish anybody whom you accuse of being heretics. Remember when Martin Luther criticized the Pope? The Pope announced him as heretic. Means he's somebody who's speaking nonsense about religion. So he wanted to use this privilege. Number three, he called the Council of the Church leaders to meet in the city of Trent in Italy, and this is why it was called the Council of Trent. He called the Council of to lay out the reforms. What kind of reforms? So, in this council that was held in uh, Trent, in Italy, one, two, three, four, five actions, sorry, four uh, actions were taken. Number one, the church interpretation of the Bible is final. Final. No one is to substitute it or by his or her own interpretation. Is it reformation then? Is it really reformation when you say that your opinion is final? It means that you don't accept other opinion, right? Is it reformation? No. It's a kind of yes. I'm telling you that I'm going to reform, but when it comes to real actions, no, they are not taking real actions. Number two, Christians need faith and good work for salvation. Remember now the difference between this and the difference between what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said that. You need faith for salvation. Now they added, even when they wanted to admit that part of God was right, they didn't want to say he was right and we were wrong. It's okay, he was right, but we were right as well. So, yes, you need faith, but you need also good work for salvation. This good work might be paying for the church. This is something good because you are paying for the church. Number three. The Bible and the church traditions are equally important authorities for guiding Christians' life. You remember what Martin Luther said? That authority should be given only to the Bible, but not the church or the Pope, because the Pope is just a human being, the same as you and I. So he commits mistakes. We are sinful in nature, right? So even when they admitted what Martin Luther said, again, they didn't want to admit it at their basis. They said, yes, Bible, but also church should be the source of authority. Number four, indulgences are valid. Again, is it a reformation process? No. Indulgences are valid expressions of faith, and he before said that Christians need faith, and it's a valid expression of faith. So again, he's encouraging people to pay for this indulgence. Now see here, guys, but the false sin of indulgence is not bad. Can anybody explain this for me? What does it mean, false sinning? It is a sinning after all. Is there a kind of false sinning and right sinning? For sure when you go to the church leader and ask him for uh, the indulgence, it means that you did some sins and you need your sins to be forgiven. So what, what, what does it mean, false and right sinning? Is there something in business called false sinning and right sinning? No. I can't understand this. Maybe, okay, maybe nowadays in the present time we can say like there are ethics in business. For example, if you want something with 100, you cannot sell it with 500. Because it's like it's too much profit. You can just sell it with like 200. All right. But here I can't understand, to be honest, I can't understand what does it mean a false sinning? If you are going intentionally, whatever you're going to the church leader, it's not that the church leader went to your face and asked you, pay money. You are going there, so it means that you already did mistakes and you don't want your mistakes to be forgiven. Then what does it mean for selling? Again, is it a reformation in process? No, no. no. Alright, yes, sister. Uh, I think we mean uh, uh, like what they did, like what the church did, was like they're selling faith in God. Yeah, but, but okay, faith yeah, for what? Yeah, so they're selling 
Yeah. Yeah. So the process yeah. itself is wrong. Yeah. The issue of selling indulgence is wrong. Yeah. Yes, but then he said at the beginning it's part of the situation of faith. Yeah. And guess what? The Jewish leaders were not sinning by God. Again, people who used to make mistakes used to go to the church and ask them for giving them this paper and read them for money. Right? So, you could have saved for our story. He could have saved for example. Alright, you can, or like true believers can get salvation for free. In this case, yeah, I can accept it. Because again, human beings are so from nature and for sure they are going to make mistakes. And if they make mistakes, for sure they are going to ask for forgiveness if they are true believers. So this is the only way they so they have to go to the church. Then why do I have to pay money for it? Right? Yes, sir. Uh, when you pay like a higher price, that's what you do. And you were you're supposed to pay. What was it? Sorry, what do you mean? When you? You're supposed to pay. You're supposed to pay for, for the mistakes that you know, for the forgive, for giving the forgiveness. Okay. Like double the amounts. Okay, so okay, so as if you are saying, this is what I could understand. I don't know if you, if you understood it the same way. As far as I understand you, it means that like there is like a, a specific price for the indulgence, but just priests who used to take more than the price. Right? But what was the price? In this case, why the Pope, for example, couldn't like, you know, specify that the price for this product is 1,000, 100, whatever. Like, for example, when you go to buy a Pepsi can, so they did it, 1.553 cents. Right? Because they don't want anybody to fool you and send it to you in, in a higher price. Yes. So again, if this is what, what was meant here, and, and why not? I can agree with you. That's a if this is what is meant here, then he should have like done it in a proper way. Yes. So point of question is because they're not uh, real, uh, real like priests. Uh, yeah. Okay. So here, yeah. Okay. So he's like you know he's criticizing the wrong, uh, that you say the corrupted leaders, you mean, and not the sinning of the of the adoption. They're saying they're saying that's fake and not. But, but again, I can't understand how the church leader is going to fool people by selling them something if they didn't do mistakes. Mm -hmm. Like, as far as I can understand it, the meaning here is fake or false selling of, of if, if, for example, a church leader is telling to somebody and saying, listen, you did a lot of mistakes and then you have to pay in order to be forgiven. Yes, but it's not the same way. I mean, it's, the thing didn't happen in this way. The thing used, used to happen in, in, in another way. The mistaker used to go to the church and ask for the forgiveness. Unless, if when he used to go, go there and confess his mistakes, the church leader used, for example, to make it very big, and even if it's a small mistake, so that he can gain more money. It could, I don't know, it could be. Yes? It's like uh, some guy of the street is telling them to uh, change their lives. Okay. And then they might go And then he asks them, they might go to I don't know. If you pay, if the if the guy who made a mistake, yeah, yes, so I'm I'm check. okay, um, you won't get a positive from God. Yeah, you mean the the meaning behind the city of this? It's like it's yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, this is what is meant. But I accept it. Okay, this is this is acceptable. Yeah, this is acceptable interpretation. Right, because they, they are fooling them, but they, they, they this paper means that God has already forgiven you. Yeah, well, so it could be, you're right, you're right. I agree. It's like a poor accept of the adventures. I'm not going to answer the word, and you're right with it. No, but it should be by a church leader. And then the day church leader, actually, you would have no authority if you are saying it as a church leader, this day. But I, I, I think the interpretation, uh, he said this. It's more of a accurate Because it's the truth, yeah. They were fooling the people by telling them that this has me, this may actually have that And this is not, like, there's nothing to do with classic. Yeah, I guess I agree. Alright, let's see now Paul the Fourth and what he did. Paul the Fourth did one very important achievement in their opinion. This one achievement was making a list of forbidden books. A list of books that he didn't want true Catholics to read. And guess what? 
these books are for mainly the Protestants. So they really didn't want his uh, people, his supporters, to read books written by the Protestants so that they would go to shift or convert. Okay, last slide guys is about the legacy of this age. We've been talking about the formation for more than two weeks now, and for sure this age will say left certain influence on the society. There are two actually types of legacy. The first legacy is on the religious and social side, and then on the political level. Guys, in the religious side, Catholic Church was more unified. Do you agree? We started by saying that the Catholics lost lots of supporters. Do you agree that the Catholic Church became more unified as a result of the Reformation age? No. Who agrees? <laughs> Only one person? Okay. Who didn't agree? Okay, so Ali, uh, right? Your name is Ali, right? Can you tell me just why you agree with this? It's the improvement the Catholic states. Guys, do you know that he's the only one who just got a job? Everybody is the only one who got a job. That is right, right. First of all, admitting that there was a mistake by saying that they are doing the reform. This is kind of unification. Number two, making the schools to attract more supporters. It's kind of unification. Number three, trying to promote their own sect teachings into outside Europe. This is kind of unification. But the issue is, being more unified did not have an adherence of Protestantism. Still, Protestantism was growing. Number two, Catholics and Protestants created schools throughout Europe, which means that there was a kind of another type of fight. It is not like the, the, the traditional type of fighting, war. It's a kind of race on who's going to gain more supporters, and this is why both of them started to make schools, which was something positive in the society, because it promoted more education. So, can you see now how history is ironical, guys? Out of negativity, we got positivity. Number three, status of women did not improve. So, although lots of things took place in Europe at that time, but still women were always projected as housewives. Alright? On the political side, Catholic Church power listened, no doubt. Remember during the Dark Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance Age how the Church was very strong, was dominating actually. Now, they lost their power to the kings and monarchs. Remember the story of King Henry. Now he gained power at the head of the church and he just marginalized the Pope. Number two, reformations, questioning of beliefs, brought intellectual ferment. This period of time paved the way to the second period of time that comes after, which is the Enlightenment age. So now, guys, let's just finish the lesson with this. Follow me. Follow the timeline. Dark ages. Where European knew nothing, right? 200 years of no achievement, right? Then Renaissance, when they turned to become creative. Then, by being creative, they were enabled to reform. Being reformed enabled them to start something more creative, which is the Enlightenment Age, number four. Being enlightened, this has led them to the industrialization age. Wow. Being industrialized has enabled them to create machines and new technology that give them the upper hand over other countries, so they started the age of imperialism or colonization, the thing that we're going to study in created one in China. And this is how they dominated the whole world and occupied other countries. Thank you. This is